Good morning. Good to see all of you here. Welcome to the Palm Springs Drive, Church of Christ, where we worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost, all that we might grow to God's glory. If you're visiting with us, we're so grateful to have you. Uh, this is going to sound a little strange since I'm only 33 years old, but uh, hearing from uh, Brother Roy this morning and from Matt last week uh, gives me hope for the future generation, uh, that there are men like this who are dedicated to the Lord and wanting to become preachers of His Word, and they're already uh, preaching His Word. And I think that uh, we just need to keep these young men in our prayers, encourage them in whatever way that we can. I know that when I uh, started out at 23, uh, you all were such a support uh, to me and an encouragement to me, and I know how important that is. So uh, let's uh, make sure to do the same for Roy this morning as well. Well, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6 as we talk about the fact that we reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6, we're going to start in, verses, in verse 7 and read down through verse 8. Paul says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. If you'll recall from our Bible class in Galatians, Paul spends the last two chapters, chapters 5 and 6, defending against this accusation that if we don't have to follow the law of Moses, if we have this freedom in Christ, well, that that somehow means we can live however we want. Paul assures them in these verses that's not the case because our actions have consequences. And he compares it to a farmer who sows seed, and really whatever kind of seed that farmer sows is directly related to what that farmer will harvest or reap. If he sows watermelon seeds, he's going to reap watermelon. If he sows mustard seeds, he's going to grow or reap mustard trees. The consequence of the harvest is always directly linked to the kind of seed that is sown. It is an unbreakable law. And Paul says if we plant seeds of the flesh by making sinful choices, then, then we will receive harmful consequences as our harvest. But on the other hand, if we make righteous choices, we will reap eternal life. And the major truth about farming is that the harvest is always greater than what you sow. So, for instance, if I sow an apple seed, my hope is not just to get one apple in return. <laughs> the hope is to get an apple tree that bears fruit and has apples on all of the branches, all that came from that one seed. So there's a compounding or an intensification of what we sow. I want to lay down kind of a second analogy beside this one. Uh, because it reminds me of what sometimes is referred to as the miracle of compound interest. It's this idea that if you invest your money in a good investment, the money itself will grow exponentially over time. So, for instance, let's say you're 25 years old and you decide, I'm going to put $100 a month into an account, into maybe a good mutual fund account, and I'm just going to do that, $100 a month from age 25. I'm going to do that for 40 years so that when I'm 65, I'll, I'll have some money there. Well, if you were to do the math on that and add up how much money you will have put into that account over those 40 years, it would be $48,000. But when you retire at 65, after having done that, you're not just going to get 48000 because of the power of compound interest, you're going to get half a million dollars. The investment of around 50000 let's say, was compounded to 10 times as much at the end because of that good investment. However, let's say, on the other hand, you make a sinful decision, you make a poor decision, you go and you gamble all that $50,000 away in Vegas. Now your losses are compounded too, because not only have you lost the $50,000, but actually you lost the half a million that it could have become had you put it in a good investment. Here's the lesson. Today's choices compound tomorrow's consequences. What we do today not only creates consequences for tomorrow, and by the way, consequences can be good or bad here. We usually use consequences just in a negative sense, but really it just means results. 
I use the C because it fits with choices in compound a little bit better. But the idea there is that it not only do our choices create consequences for tomorrow, it actually compounds those consequences or intensifies those consequences because of the unbreakable laws of sowing and reaping and investment and return. And I want to break these two verses down into three parts to help drive this point home to, uh, this morning. Number one, Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Again, the law of sowing and reaping, it, it just can't be broken. You can't go out and sow watermelon seeds and then reap corn. It's just not how it works. Likewise, if a person thinks that they can spend their money on fancy cars and vacations and maybe a, a never-ending Amazon Prime delivery van convoy, but they never invest in retirement, the law of investment and return is going to say they're just not going to have money at, at retirement in the end. Yet Paul warns us against being deceived about this because isn't it true that many times we think this law can be broken because I can break it. Because maybe, maybe we convince ourselves I'm different. I'm exempt from the way things work. I can make whatever choices I want now and things will still be okay in the future. In a, in a way, it, it's kind of like thumbing our nose at God and saying, I know that you design things to work this way, but not going to happen to me. I'm going to be just fine. God will not be mocked. The law of sowing and reaping, of investment and return cannot be broken. Turn with me now to 2 Samuel, please, chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, David is the king, and he's at home all alone while his men are off to war. And here's what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let's read verses 2 through 4 to start. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had uh, purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. So here, David in this moment is trying to break the law of sowing and reaping. He thinks he can make this sinful choice and there won't be any consequences. After all, her husband is away and so he's never going to find out. But then something happens that causes David to panic. And that's the next verse, verse 5. The woman conceived and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Well, now there's a serious problem for David. He's got an unforeseen consequence that's going to lead to more unforeseen consequences when her husband finds out that she's pregnant and he knows he's not the one that did it because he's been away at war. And so David tries to break the law of sowing and reaping again by murdering her husband. But he knows if I do that, well, then there's going to be more consequences because she's going to know I murdered her husband and then Bathsheba is not going to want anything to do with me. So he makes it look like Uriah got killed in battle. And I'll just tell you, it looked like David succeeded. Like he had actually cheated the system. Like he had actually sown watermelon and reaped corn somehow. Looking down at verse 27, just the first part of it. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife. So it looks like David got everything he wanted. And now Bathsheba has even become his wife. It's a win-win all around until we get to the second part of that verse, verse 27. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. It seemed like he was able to sow watermelon and get corn seemed like he was able to spend all his money on fun and good times and sin and still get a great return in the end. But God will not be mocked. Maybe nobody else saw it. He got away with it from a human perspective, but the Lord saw the whole thing. And in the next chapter, Nathan is going to confront David about his sin, and then the horrific consequences will roll in. John Edwards was a former North Carolina senator who ran for president in 2008. In that year, the truth came out that he had been in an extramarital affair with a woman for two years while his own wife was suffering from breast cancer. And like David in 2 Samuel, part of the reason this came out was because the woman that John was with got pregnant. And he had tried and tried to cover this up and, and hide it and deny it, but eventually 
The truth came out. He, he had to admit that he was the father. And when the truth came out, his campaign manager said, quote, thousands of friends of the senator and his supporters have put their faith and confidence in him, and he's let them down. It was the end of John's political career, and he was even indicted by a federal grand jury on six felony charges for the illegal use of campaign funds to try to cover up the affair and to try to take care of this woman and, and their child on the side secretly. And he ended up being charged with $2.1 million in fines. And I'm bringing this up because in a later interview with ABC, they asked John why he did this. And he said this, he said, my experiences fed a self-focus, an egotism, a narcissism that leads you to believe you can do whatever you want. You're invincible, and there will be no consequences. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We cannot plant corn and expect watermelon. We can't make sinful, foolish choices and expect good consequences or results. That's not how life works. And there may be times where it seems like we have cheated the system, like we are breaking this law of sowing and reaping a vestment and return in a successful way. But eventually, those consequences always catch up to us. Usually it happens sometime in this life, but always in eternity. It reminds me of Numbers chapter 32 when Moses is trying to encourage the, the tribes that are on the east side of the Jordan River that they need to make sure to help their brethren fight the Canaanites. He's saying, don't think that just because you're not technically in Canaan, you're kind of on the east side, that you don't have any responsibility. No, you need to come help drive the Canaanites out with your brethren. And then he tells them this. If you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Let's get practical about what this means in our lives. Parents, if you, if you want your children to grow up, to put the Lord first, that means today's choices matter. The choices you help them make today are crucial for the future that you are envisioning for them. If you want your children to put the Lord first when they grow up. We have to make sure that the children aren't putting themselves first now. If you let them be selfish and talk back to you or talk down to you or talk down to your siblings, that's only going to compound over time when they get older because their future is inseparably linked to their present. For those who are teenagers especially, but even young adults, there is kind of this temptation to think, I'm young, and what's the phrase? I'm going to sow my wild oats. <laughs> I can sow whatever I want, and, and it'll be just fine because, you know what? Later, I'm going to be righteous. I, I'm, when I get older, that's when I'm going to start making righteous choices. But right now, I'm young. I can, it doesn't really matter what I do now. No. The time for righteous choices is right now. The time to spend more time on spiritual things than on social media is right now. The time to reject sinful entertainment choices on Netflix and Hulu is right now. The time to reach out to those in need, to get off the sidelines in the church and get plugged in is right now. The time to buckle down and develop some self-control and self-discipline to set good goals for yourself is right now. The time to burn old habits in life like the Ephesian Christians did in Acts chapter 19 by burning their magic books. Time to burn those old habits is now. To the men of this congregation who might one day serve as elders, the time to start making choices that align with the elders' qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are now. You're not just going to wake up one day and say, well, I'm an elder in the sense that I'm older <laughs> and now I'm magically qualified. No, no, those choices have to be made now to put yourself on that trajectory for the future. And to all of us, 
We must not deceive ourselves into thinking that today's choices don't matter because I'll just make righteous choices tomorrow. No, today's choices are inseparably linked to tomorrow's consequences, whether for good or bad. And not only are they linked to those consequences, today's choices actually compound tomorrow's consequences. We're going to see that compounding effect more in this next point, that if we sow to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. Uh, Paul uses this graphic Word uh, corruption means decay or decomposition, death, because Paul understands you always reap more than what you sow. You sow one seed and it brings a huge harvest, and sin always has a compounding effect so that a little bit of sin can bring a huge return of unwanted consequences. If your Bibles are still open to 2 Samuel, look in chapter 12 now when Nathan confronts David. Let's start in verse 9, and I just want to note the first part of this verse, and then we'll pause. Listen to the question he asks. He says in verse 9, Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? In other words, why have you mocked God, David? By thinking that his word doesn't apply to you. By thinking that you could break the law of sowing and reaping and get away with it. Why have you despised the Lord? And let's continue now. <clears throat> you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife and have killed with the sword, uh, have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives from before your eyes and give them to your companions, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. As you continue reading through 2 Samuel, there's an enormous compounding effect of David's one act of passion with Bathsheba. The child they bore together dies. Then one of David's sons, Amnon, violates his sister, Tamar. And then another one of David's sons is so angry about that, he kills Amnon and David loses Amnon. He loses another child. And then Absalom rebels against David, tries to usurp the throne, chases David out of Jerusalem. And even though David comes back eventually and tries to protect Absalom, Absalom is killed. David loses another child. So much misery. So many horrendous consequences in exchange for what? Maybe 30 minutes of pleasure. David invested 30 minutes of his time in the wrong investment, and the compound interest of that choice yielded a return of decades worth of pain and suffering. The book of Hosea was written to the sinful nation of Israel who had broken God's heart because of their allegiance to idols. And listen to how Hosea describes what they were doing. He says in Hosea 8, verse 7, They sow the wind, and they reap the whirlwind. Such a powerful image. Spiritually speaking, instead of sowing seed, which would actually be productive and be pleasing to the Lord, the idea is that they're sowing wind, which is really a statement about they're sowing emptiness. What they're doing is, is pointless and, and displeasing to the Lord. And since they believed that it was better to use their time investing in empty, useless, and even sinful things by sowing wind, God says, what I'll do is I'm going to take the wind that you have sown, and then I will create a whirlwind. I will create a, a cyclone or a hurricane, essentially, of destruction because of it. And he does. He takes the Assyrian nation, and he uses them as the hurricane to wipe Israel off the map for their idolatry. That huge hurricane of destruction that came upon Israel all started with the sowing of a gentle breeze of sin. Compounding effect. <clears throat> Oscar Wilde, <clears throat> he was a famous playwright in Victorian London. He was widely known and respected 
and he wrote the novel of uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray. However, he became enslaved to the pleasures of a homosexual lifestyle. And in the 1800s Victorian period, that will destroy your reputation and land you in jail. And that's exactly what happened to Oscar Wilde. But here's what's interesting. Because so far in our sermon, I've been describing to you all the external consequences, the things that happen to us because of our sinful choices, like all those things that happened to David in his life, or the things even that happened to, to John Edwards, the loss of his political career, or the, the Assyrian destruction of Israel, or even Oscar Wilde that destroyed his reputation. He ends up in jail. But what's interesting and fascinating is that while Wilde was in prison, he, he wrote a letter in which he described the consequences of his choices. Yet in that letter, the consequences were not just about his ruined reputation in the prison time. It was about the consequences that happened in him to his heart. He said this, I grew careless of the lives of others. I took pleasure where it pleased me and passed on. I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character, and that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber, one has someday to cry aloud from the housetop. I ceased to be Lord over myself. I was no longer the captain of my soul and did not know it. I allowed pleasure to dominate me. I ended in horrible disgrace. You see, sinful choices sowing to the flesh, making bad investments spiritually, not only leads us to unwanted external consequences, but also to unwanted internal consequences. And here's the frightening difference between those two when it comes to sin. The external consequences may not come for a very long time, but the internal consequences happen in our hearts immediately. It took Oscar Wilde a long time and three separate trials before he landed in jail. But long before that external consequence, he was losing his, himself. He was losing his, his soul and pleasure. He became enslaved and it dominated him and made him feel callous toward people. Like he had no control almost over his actions. He just, he just had to, to fulfill the, the lust of his flesh. And he just felt empty inside. Likewise, if you think about David, it is true. He faced a lot of external consequences, but a lot of those things didn't happen until later. But for instance, in Psalm 32, he describes, many believe, he's describing what it was like before he confessed his sin about Bathsheba here. In Psalm 32, verse 4, he says to God, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. In Psalm 51, which is recognized as his, con as his thanksgiving to God and confession for his sin with Bathsheba and asking for forgiveness, he says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. He may not have experienced a lot of those external consequences until way down the road, but already his, he felt it in his heart. He, he knew, I'm, I'm spiritually lifeless. I have no joy in the Lord anymore. I don't have a willing spirit to obey you, God. He knew he was just sweeping things under the rug, and it was sucking the life out of him spiritually. To go back to, go back to our money example, if I'm spending all my money and not investing in retirement, and especially if I'm spending it all on you know, just frivolous frivolous pleasures and not investing in retirement, I, I may not feel the external consequence of that for decades down the road and, until I retire. But the problem is every time I make a choice like that, there's a consequence in that moment because I'm actually training myself. I'm training my mind to think more about now than later, to think more and to value pleasure more than future provision. And every time I make that choice, I'm becoming more and more the kind of person who doesn't plan for the future. And that attitude can spill over into our lives spiritually as well. One writer said, our character is the harvest of our habits. You know, if we choose to insult our spouse, we might not experience the external consequences of that right away. Our spouse might just try to ignore it and brush it off and, and move on. 
but internally that behavior is warping my heart toward evil, and I'm becoming more and more a person who insults rather than respects my spouse. Students, if you choose to cheat off of someone else's test or get somebody else to do your homework for you and pass it off as your own, you may never get caught. You may never face any external consequences of that uh, anytime soon. You may even get some pretty good grades. But right now, you're training your heart to be lazy, which is sin. You're training your heart to take shortcuts and to try to take credit for work that is not your own, which is not pleasing to the Lord, and that will always catch up to you. And this is so practical because so often when we are tempted to sin in the moment, we ask ourselves our first go-to question, or maybe I'm just speaking to myself here, that's fine, Um, but maybe you can relate to this. Our first go-to question is often, what will happen to me later if I do this? What will happen to me later if I do this. And usually we're we're thinking about all those external consequences down the road. And Solomon actually wrote about this. He said in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. You know, sometimes as humans, once we determine the coast is clear, you know, nobody's going to see me and I'm not actually going to get away with this. We are much more tempted to sow to the flesh. How about let's ask this question instead. Instead of asking what will happen to me later if I do this, let's ask what will happen in me right now if I do this. The Apostle Paul has the answer to that. It will corrupt and warp and destroy your heart. And it'll set you on a path to become more of the type of person who will be led by the flesh and not by the Spirit of God. Today's choices compound tomorrow's consequences because they not only affect us externally by all the horrible things that might happen to us as a result of our sin, but all the things that happen in us because of our sin. Well, third and finally, the good news, if we sow to the Spirit, we'll reap eternal life. I know the sermon's been pretty heavy so far, but that's because we've been really focused on the negative aspect of this principle so far. But now we get to focus on the positive part because it's a beautiful, encouraging thing to know that this same law of sowing and reaping, the same law of investment and return works in the opposite direction with righteous choices as well. So that when we invest in righteousness by making good choices, we receive compounded returns on those investments. Look with me now back in Galatians 6 where we started. After those verses... In 7 and 8, let's turn to Galatians 6 and look at verses 9 and 10. Paul says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Perhaps this is well-timed this year. Because 2020 has been so exhausting and there may be people thinking, well, Brian, I've been doing good. I I don't see much return for that investment. Things don't really seem to be going all that great this year still. Well, that might be true in an external sense. This isn't a guarantee that if I do good, that good things are going to happen to me in this life. But I think it is a guarantee that good things will happen in me by doing these good things. Every time we make the choice to follow the will of God's Spirit, that's actually going to produce a huge spiritual harvest that we get to reap. It may take some time to see it in some ways, but here's what it looks like. Chapter 5, verses 22. Here's here's what a spiritual harvest, here's the fruit that sowing to the Spirit will produce. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Every time I sow love to somebody, I reap a loving heart from that. Every time I choose to think about heaven instead of all the troubles of this world, I'm, I'm sowing joy and I'm reaping a joyful heart. Every time I'm generous and I share my money with those who are in need, I'm I'm reaping a a generous heart. And it is true, while mostly that's going to happen immediately on the inside, 
many times it happens from the outside. We do reap external benefits as well because the more we love other people, the more they are likely to love us in return. The more patience we show to other people, the more likely they are to be patient with us in return. The more honest we are in our business practices with other people, the more likely it is that they're going to do business with us. And we're going to, we're going to reap some external benefits from that righteousness as well. So the fruit of the Spirit can be produced both internally and externally when we walk in righteousness. You remember that verse in Hosea about uh, sowing the wind and reaping the whirlwind. Listen to what God tells them to do instead. He says just a couple chapters later, sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Instead of a whirlwind of destruction, God wanted to bring a harvest of blessings to the Israelites. But he knew in order for that to happen, you have to start sowing a different kind of seed. If you want blessings and not cursings, you can't sow sinful seed. If you want blessings, you have to sow righteous seed. That's what God longs for. Not just for them, but for us. One writer uh, put it this way. He said, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. Parents, when you train your kids to use kind words toward their siblings, you are setting them up for a destiny of kindness. When you teach them to sit attentively in worship, you are preparing them for a destiny of respect for the Lord. When you teach them discipline, even though as a parent it's hard to discipline your kids, when you do that, you're setting them up for a destiny of respect for authority and obedience to God. Teens and adults, when you work hard to study God's word now, you are setting yourself for, up for a destiny of closeness to your creator. To the married couples, when you choose to put your spouse first today, to spend alone time with them today and give them priority, you're setting yourself up for a destiny of covenant faithfulness to one another. To our senior saints... I think you all know the law of sowing and reaping better than all of us. You've seen it in your life so many times. Unfortunately, you've probably seen it both ways, both good and bad. And I hope for you that you have reaped so many wonderful blessings as a result of sowing righteousness in your life. But the message to you is there's more sowing left to do. Maybe you feel weary because you've been, you've been sowing a lot longer than, than we have. And so maybe you're weary about that. Paul says, keep sowing because the ultimate harvest is not in this life. The ultimate harvest is when we get to go be with our Father in heaven. And that is an investment with a compounded return. The choices we make right now are shaping our character our future in this world, and our life for all eternity. What kind of seeds will you sow today? What will you invest in today? Today's choices matter because they compound tomorrow's consequences, whether for good or bad. Let's commit today to sowing to the Spirit because you reap what you sow. I'm going to invite you to come to the Lord. If you don't know him, and I recognize as I was thinking over my sermon, I gave you examples of people living for the flesh, people sowing to the flesh and, and reaping corruption. Talked about David, talked about John Edwards, Oscar Wilde. But I didn't really give you an example of somebody sowing to the spirit and then reaping a great harvest of righteousness. So I want to do that for you now because Jesus says something very fascinating. In John chapter 12, and verse 24, he says, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And Jesus was talking about himself there. That Jesus' body was actually a seed. That when entering the ground by death, would produce a tremendous harvest. And we are that harvest.
Jesus is the ultimate example of somebody sowing to the Spirit and reaping eternal life. He didn't just reap eternal life for himself. He reaped eternal life for all of us. And that's what he wants. And that's why he talks about evangelism with his apostles. He says, look, the, the harvest is ready. Are you ready this morning to be harvested by the power of Jesus' sacrifice? That he was willing to die, to be the seed in order to give you life and to bear fruit for eternity in your heart. You can have that this morning if you'll come to him believing that he is your Savior, believing he is the Son of God, willing to repent of your sins and be baptized into him this morning. Won't you be a part of Jesus' harvest this morning? And if you already are a Christian but you've been sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. It's not too late to turn things around, to come back to Him, start sowing to the Spirit today. If we can help you do that in any way, come forward and let us know how while we stand and sing.